Hi everyone and welcome back to The Shack and part two of our BBC Micro series. In part one we looked at the history of the machine, took it apart to see what was inside and also touched on the potential for these machines owing to the significant expansion capabilities. In this episode we'll be doing an extensive refurbishment to ensure we have many years of clean, trouble free and more importantly safe enjoyment ahead of us. We've got plans for this little machine in the future, so by the end of this episode we'll have our BBC as pretty as the day it rolled out of the factory and ready to accept whatever we throw at it. So settle down, grab a cup of coffee and enjoy the show. There's lots to do, so let's get stuck in. Before we start, we'll just remove this video out connector so we don't get it wet. The case itself has a texture which is a real dirt trap and considering for the majority of this machine's life it's likely to have been sitting in a classroom there's no wonder it's as filthy as it is. We also need to be careful when cleaning not to disturb this perforated punch out piece which when removed leaves a hole affectionately known as the ashtray. In there is space for another expansion socket this one for the Acorn speech upgrade and also the Viglan ROM cartridge system amongst others. We'll just remove this perspex strip by unclipping one side from underneath and pulling it free. So let's fill up the sink and make a start on this ingrained dirt. For the overall clean we're using washing up liquid and lukewarm water and we'll make sure to use a non-scratch pad. This initial clean is intended to remove the majority of the surface dirt and debris and it's important to keep this light, don't go too vigorously at this stage as you risk missing or worse breaking something. Keep an eye out especially for labels and remove them as gently as possible so we can reattach them later. And with the initial wash finished, we can remove the pieces from the sink and continue with a toothbrush and really get into the texture and all the corners and stubborn bits. And after a few minutes on this section, you can already see what a difference this makes. Unfortunately, there's no real alternative to hours of good solid scrubbing, but it's needed it's probably the first wash it's had in 40 years. But the results speak for themselves. Lovely. So with the case looking good as new, it's time to move on to the main board. We'll start with a liberal coating of isopropyl alcohol, which as you know is my go-to cleaning agent as it shifts most things. Then, using anti-static brushes, we go to work, making sure we get into every small crevice we can find. If a chip is socketed and you're comfortable doing it, you could always pull the chips before cleaning. It's up to you. This board isn't too bad, so I'm not going to do that. I am, however, going to remove these stickers, very carefully just in case. I couldn't find anything on the internet referring to Jude or Judith in association with these machines, but if you know otherwise, please leave a comment and I can pop them back in. We'll also give the underside of the board a good scrub and it's a good idea to always be on the lookout for small patch wires on these older machines as often things were fixed after the final designs had gone to the manufacturers. We've got a patch wire here so I'm going to cover it with some captain tape to help keep it safe some more stickers and I'm fairly certain these were quality assurance labels. There are two on top of each other here so let's get rid of them and clean the area up. So case done, mainboard done, time for a quick cuppa and then onto the keyboard. And unsurprisingly the keyboard is in a right state having collected dust crumbs and all manner of debris over the years. Using a key puller we make short work of removing all the keys and then start to work on the keyboard itself, IPA and scrubbing being the normal order of business.
We'll pop all the keyboard caps into some lukewarm water with a dash of washing up detergent and give the key soup a good swirl. Next we have to clean each keycap individually and place it on Mrs Retro Shack's finest tea towel to drain. You could of course use a less fine tea towel but I can't guarantee your results. We'll pop them back into a bowl of clean water to rinse off before going through the whole process again. It takes time but this is the bit of the computer you spend the most time touching so it's right and proper that it gets the most attention. While the keys are drying we'll turn our attention to the power supply and the fitting of new capacitors. After undoing the screws holding the power supply assembly to its chassis we need to take note of where all the wires connect to the switch so we can replace them properly when we're done. Again it will help to take a photo to refer to. Once you're happy you know where everything goes we can clip the zip tie holding the wires together and start to unclip them. This may require a significant amount of swearing so make sure there are no kiddies around while you're doing it. Eventually we're able to remove the switch by pressing in the clips at the top and bottom and doing a lot of wiggling. We'll remove the screws holding the PCB to the steel chassis at which point we can manoeuvre the PCB without desoldering all the remaining wires or worrying about the other socket by pulling and rotating the board out like this. Recapping the board takes a little time. On this particular unit all of the polarities for the capacitors were marked on the board but it's always a good idea to check the outgoing capacitor and align the new one the same way. If anything doesn't match up check the schematics as a mistake here could be dangerous. Along the way there are a couple of nasty surprises which we'll have to deal with which is common for a machine of this age. On this unit we've got a few areas where solder pads have lifted and there's nothing left to flow solder onto so we're going to have to route to the nearest points on the board and create our own connections. There are also a few areas where reflowing the solder will create better joints so let's get that done. Looking at the positive and negative legs on this capacitor we're in luck as both of them will reach to alternative locations so we'll bend and clip them to size before soldering them to their new homes. We need to make sure to follow traces neatly and make solid joints as we don't want these legs to come free and move about causing a short or possibly damage to the machine. If you're at all unsure about doing this yourself there are companies and individuals who offer PSU servicing. Just do a little search on the interweb. With those lifted pads rerouted We'll just pop round and solder in all the other new capacitors, reflow some old and cold joints and pop the unit back together again before we test so we can ensure that we don't have any shorts or issues as a result of putting the board back. Time to plug it in and check the voltages. We're looking for a steady 5 volts which is distributed across the BBC Micro mainboard and according to the service manual this was to reduce the need for thick tracks on the board to distribute power. Clever and we've got a nice solid 5 volts. All of the keycaps are dry now so let's pop them back onto the keyboard. The spacebar is the fiddliest bit so we'll do that first and then the rest in a very satisfying jigsaw puzzle. Looking good so let's pop it all back together now. If you remember from the last video the power cable isn't removable and has a moulded plug on the end but I've learned a trick or two since then. Just watch how easily this goes through when you've figured it out. Putting the rest of the old girl back together is now really straightforward. We'll pop the freshly serviced power supply in place, being careful not to trap any of the small power wires in the process. We can then tighten the three screws that hold it in from beneath the case. Now it's time to replace the video out connector. 
In a future episode I may add some connectors here to avoid the need for soldering when I want to work on the main board. And it's the main board that goes in next. Be gentle and make sure everything is lined up correctly before sliding it into place and screwing it to the case. Again, screws into plastic so make sure you find the thread before screwing in to avoid damage. Then, referring to the pictures we took previously, we can reattach all of the power connectors to their correct places, being doubly careful to check that our positive and negative connections are the right way round. Now let's resolder the video out connector, again making sure we get the connections the right way round. Extra important to check here as both cables are the same colour. Now folks it's mystery ROM time. It's important to fit ROMs before you attach the keyboard as the ROM slots here aren't accessible with the keyboard on. Remember to line the notch up in the chip with the notch up in the socket. Line it up, apply gentle pressure and she should slide straight in. Now in the last video I mentioned this was a power cable. It isn't of course, it's the cable that goes to the speaker. Silly me. Let's reattach it anyway, followed by the keyboard ribbon connector. Be very careful lining this up and pressing it into place as it can be quite fragile. Once the keyboard is on and secure, gently manoeuvre the ribbon cable down so it clears the top of the case. Let's screw the keyboard in using the screws on either side. These are a bit fiddly as you have to hold the nut in from underneath, but it's a quick job once you've got the hang of it. Now we'll replace the top part of the case and screw in the two screws on the rear and the two screws underneath. Just one job left, and that's to clean the power cable. I think if you're gonna to go to the trouble of refurbishing the whole machine, not doing the power cable is a bit of a cheap way out. It's this kind of attention to detail that makes the final product just so nice, so beautiful, and almost as good as the day that she rolled out of the factory. I'm really pleased with the way this has turned out. I suppose the only thing left to do is to see if she actually works. And now for the moment of truth. Deep breath and... Phew! All good. And you can see here a little clue to the ROM we installed earlier. It's a Turbo MMC ROM and we'll go through what that is along with many other things in the next episode entitled ROMs ROMs ROMs. For now though, it's clear that we have access to a good many BBC titles, so let's first give our old favourite, Chucky Egg, a quick go. I've whizzed through the rather annoying noise that Chucky Egg makes while it's loading, but here we are. I haven't seen that screen in a long while. Actually quite excited to play a bit of Chucky Egg. First need to redefine the keys, QA, OP and space being my uh, favourites. Now I can't guarantee I'm any good at this, it's been a dog's age since I played, uh, just one player. Uh, muscle memory should kick in, off we go. I've got to say, it's a delight to see these old BBC games in good quality. This is through a, a SCART cable, an RGB to SCART cable. Um, I'll put a link in the description as to where I got this from. Um, yeah, I seem to be terrible at this. Muscle memory has failed me. But never mind. Uh, let's have a look at something else. I think it's shift and break. And let's have a look at Elite. Another seminal title for the BBC. Um, again, a game I wasn't actually any good at. I can never remember the keys. No, we don't want to load a new commander. 
and yep all looking good so thank you very much for joining me in this refurbishment um, if you enjoyed the channel please subscribe and hit the bell for new notifications uh, and other than that thanks for joining me I'll see you next time in the shack goodbye